Welcome to Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. My guest today is Dr. Jerome F. Keating, retired professor of National Taipei University, author and also a political activist. Dr. Keating has written four books about Taiwan. His most recent book, The Paradigms That Guide Our Lives and Drives Our Souls, explores the different prisms through which one views life and might cause them to change. Certainly, there are many paradigms through which we can better understand Taiwan. Dr. Keating is joining us via Skype from his home in Taipei. Welcome to Asia in Review. Or I should say, welcome back. This is your second appearance. Okay, well, Bill, good to be back. And uh, it looks like you're pretty comfortable there in Hawaii. Yeah, you know, one thing about the weather in Hawaii, it's a lot more stable than the weather in Taipei. I mean, it's you know constantly warm and balmy and we're blessed by the trade winds. And yes, it does rain a little bit every day, but nothing like uh, the rain in Nangang. Or I'm also told that Muja, in uh, that section of Taipei, it rains a lot too. So I suppose we're blessed here weather-wise. OK. Oops. Well, um, let's, uh, let's talk about your book. Um, OK, tell us the um, paradigms, OK? Paradigms that guide our lives and drive our soul. Um, tell us, what's the thesis? Let's start off there with kind of a basic question. Okay, I, maybe I should start with the, I'll throw out some paradigms, Bill, and then I think that people can relate to because paradigms are both models and they're ways of perceiving reality. And so, like, if I throw out the Middle Kingdom, mm -hmm. you know, that's a paradigm that a lot of Chinese have had, and the way also we have viewed China as regards Asia. Mm -hmm. Or if I throw out the paradigm, let's make America great again, uh, you know, then you have to say, okay, what was the model for greatness of America? Uh, that's a current thing in the U.S. A paradigm that the Earth is flat, then uh, a geocentric universe, a heliocentric, those are paradigm shifts. Usually you become aware of paradigms when you have a paradigm shift, the uh, uh, okay. paradigm okay. Shift, good or bad, like a paradigm of the master race, which Germany, in a way, used or Hitler used to make Germany great again. So those are some examples of where they drive people's souls. So why why should we why should we care about paradigms? Well, I I think we need to care about them because they are though we don't realize it, they are the way that we perceive reality. And Prisons through which we view life. They, well, they put us in a bubble in a way. The, uh, you know, and, and that bubble is our perception of reality. So that isn't necessarily bad. It's the only one we have. But we need to constantly expand it. The, so I'm... I'm in the book I'm really pushing for tolerance both understanding our own paradigms uh, but also pushing for tolerance of other paradigms to, if we can join in the same goal does that mean cultural understanding is that essentially what you're getting at yeah a an understanding and uh, acceptance of where people are coming from um, let me throw a paradigm at you that I think both you and I would relate. You know, the global village paradigm, mm -hmm. which Marshall McLuhan brought in, or at least coined the phrase in the 60s. Mm -hmm. I think you, you would relate to that. And I, 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 remember, I remember Marshall McLuhan from uh, when I was a freshman. Okay, right. And you probably locked in, you know, the global village was a new way of looking at the world, at business, at trade, at communication. Uh, the paradigm I'm going to be pushing for at the end of the book is a global home. Mm. That's a major paradigm shift. But if you understand how paradigms are formed, it's easier to make paradigm shifts because Paradigm shifts depend on new information. And if you're open to new information, you can then 
be open to new paradigms. Mm, interesting. Um, you know, as you were talking about, you know, how you conclude the book, you know, a, 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 a sort of a, uh, a global paradigm, seeing the world in one way uh, so as to, as I understand it, to reduce tension, to reduce acrimony, to reduce the possibilities of war. In other words, uh, everybody lived in peace. Um, it makes me sort of think, I believe this or not, it, believes me, uh, it makes me recall what Mao Zedong said about you know, the, the Paris Commune and his idea of society was that society should be built along the lines of the Paris Commune. However, the Paris Commune really didn't work too well in the, at the end. But, um, yeah, I don't yeah, know. I, I just happened to think of that as you were talking. Okay, the, uh, I'm pushing, as I say, a global home. So when you have a global home, you then have to say is a global family is the family of man. And mm. that embraces all cultures, all religions. When you look at paradigms, we have these three realms, the realms of physics, metaphysics. Metaphysics deals with ideologies, religion, philosophy, and these are ways that we think the world should be, and therefore we have competing ideologies. And then, of course, phenomenology is kind of what's in it for me, and the way I think the world should be, as well as what it is for me. Are, so are, you, are you creating a, a utopia through your exploration of paradigms? Uh, I'm not pushing for a utopia, but uh, I, I like to use the metaphor of the family. Mm -hmm. You know, most families can function as a family. There will always be disputes in the family mm -hmm. between parents, between children, siblings, uh, but they still realize that the good of the family is the overall good. Mm. And I think that's the... Your language is an important thing in expressing paradigms, and metaphors, of course, are a major part of language. So the family of man, when you look at that and how the uh, different races, different cultures have to get along with each other like brothers and sisters. And, uh, well, I know you've got at least a sister, Bill. I can't right. remember any other family members, but... You probably had some spats with her in the past. Oh, never, 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 not at all. <laughs> <laughs> so um, tell me, um, let's let's hold up your book again. Maybe, Zuri, could we get a picture of that up on the screen? Okay, and I'll put this to the side since it creates a little bit of glare. Um, is your book available on Amazon? If someone wants to go and buy it, uh, can they get it on Amazon, which seems to be the easiest way to purchase books these days? Okay, that I'm working on right now. I, I'm working with a couple of people to get it on Amazon and make it available. Mm -hmm. That cover, by the way, is the second paradigm shift that I have. Once we recognize a global home, now that's going to be tough because it means we have to respect the environment as part of our home. Mm -hmm. And it means we have to have an economical system which benefits all members of the family and not a zero-sum game. So that's a tough part. But the second paradigm shift then is that once we realize uh, once we have established a center of home and a family we can then look to our going from that home to our destiny in the stars and the universe and mm. that's a there are people that are looking at that already uh i think of like who's that neil um uh, uh de Grasse, ryan and mm. others you know that have a vision of the universe that we belong to and that we can explore. Hmm. I'm thinking, you know, this in a way ties back to my books on Taiwan, ironically. 
when you think of when Magellan set out from Spain, you know, to circumnavigate the world, mm -hmm. he didn't make it, but one of his ships, it took it three years, they knew the world was round, they knew they could make it back if they went all the way around, but they didn't know how, they didn't know what they would run into. Uh, so um, a, a book like this takes a lot of research to write. I mean, you're dealing with all sorts of um, uh, different fields of inquiry. How long did it take you to write it? It took me at least two to three years. Mm. Now, a lot of the ideas have been germinating since my graduate studies. The, oh. uh, you know, like the, I remember one author I read, Mircea Eliade, who was a historian of religions, mm -hmm. and he spoke about cultures and people having a sense of the sacred and the profane. Now, the sacred and the profane are paradigmatic ways of looking at the world and reality. And if you start to understand a culture's sense of the sacred or a people's sense of the sacred, you start to understand them better. Mm. The, so we're approaching reality, but never quite getting there. The, uh, so what, what were the particular, uh, we're coming up here on break here pretty soon, but uh, what were the particular challenges in writing the book? Well, I think the big challenge was that the scope of it is so wide. Mm. The, you know, it covers physics, metaphysics, phenomenology, and trying to get all those to blend together into one coherent message, and, and yet keep it succinct enough that it wouldn't be too academic, too boring, uh, you know, something that people could get a hand on, and something that, uh, you know, people could see as applying to their life. The... Okay, we have one minute until break, so let me squeeze in this question here. How can we use uh, your book uh, and this, your exploration, your investigation of paradigms to better understand Taiwan? How can we use it? Okay, mm -hmm. the, uh, you want an answer now or you want to wait? Well, the... well, let's try to get this in before the break. We have about 45 seconds. Okay, well, I think the, you know, you have to look at what is Taiwan's national narrative? And mm. what is Taiwanese perspective on the world? And everyone, people are talking, is Taiwan a bargaining chip? China wants to say it's part of one China. You know, different people, it, it's been a pawn often in the past, but it has 23 million people, the same as Australia. Uh, it certainly should not be a pawn and it should be treated as a people, a democracy, that have their own paradigmatic view of the world and where they belong. Good, good, good. Well, let's, uh, uh, Zuri, can we go to break now? You're watching Think Tech Hawaii, exploring the world we live in, recognizing the changes around us, and looking into the future of our lives together in these islands. Great content for Hawaii from Think Tech. Aloha, my name is Justine Spiritu. This is my co-host Matthew Johnson. Every Thursday at 4 p.m. on ThemeTech, we host the Hawaii Food and Farmer Series. We like to bring in folks from the whole realm of the local food supply and agriculture, anyone working on these issues, any organization or individual that has plans or projects. What kind of people have we had on? Uh, so we've had farmers, we've had chefs, we've had people from government, uh, larger institutions, everyone who's working to help make Hawaii's local food system that much better. So you can see us every Thursday and join the conversation on Twitter, and we hope to see you there. Oh, we're back again. Uh, we're talking to Dr. Jerome uh, Keating. He's joining us via Skype from Taipei, uh, Taiwan. Uh, by the way, he's lived there 28 years. He has a very good uh, insight into Taiwan society and particularly Taiwan politics. First part of the show, we talked about his new book that deals with paradigms. 
And now we want to get into um, um, taking advantage of his knowledge of Taiwan politics and see if we can learn a little bit. Um, so Jerome, how would you evaluate the presidency of Tsai Ing-wen to this date? Okay, the, uh, that's a, a good question, Bill. It's a, in some ways, a tough one to answer. I mean, she's in her first year. She was elected on January 20, but took office on May 20 of 2016. So she hasn't yet completed her full year. And I thought about that question and I'd like to give an answer of 70%, but let me explain it. Okay. The, you know, it's not a grade like a test. You take a test and you get an A, a B, or C, or whatever. It's more, think of it like a term paper. And she has started into her paper. She is getting into the process. It's looking good, but you don't know yet what the final result would be. And there are a number of burning issues on the plate so that she will have to deal with and we'll see how her team works them out. The other day there was a huge demonstration in front of the president's office and um, it was all about pension reform, which is uh, a long burning issue, an issue which the Guomindang, the KMT, didn't deal with very well. Um, what's your take on that? The On the pensions? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, that probably, I would say right now, the hottest issue in Taiwan is pension and pension reform. Mm. And this is a needed thing. Uh, it's The problem of it has come a result of a dealing from the past one-party stake days when people in the military and the government and education were given, they didn't have great salaries at that time, so they were given a great pension plan. And like many of them have, can draw 70 to 80% of their previous salary when they are retired. Now that's a great pension plan. It's better than any social security you or I can get. Mm. And But they also can put a certain amount of money in the bank, untouched, and draw 18% interest. Mm. Now, I don't know anywhere in the world that you can put money in the bank and draw 18% interest and any government that could sustain that. So this is what you know has to be dealt with. Obviously, those people are upset because they're, they're losing out. <laughs> is being touched. Well, um, okay. Which does not qualify for that now. And they are cutting it for both, you know, teachers and everyone and the bank percentage. That There's no way you can sustain that. So this is the pension reform. And uh, it's going to probably hit the legislative yen in March. Okay. So, well, about that's two okay. I don't mean to cut you off. Results. All right. Uh, that's her key domestic challenge at the moment. Of course, her international challenge, or uh, well, her challenge in cross strait relations, and I suppose that's international in that it ultimately involves the U.S. as well as China and Taiwan, is um, her um, refusal to recognize the 92 consensus. And should she recognize the 92 consensus? Uh, no way, in my mind. You know, the, well, perhaps uh, we should back up a bit here and explain just briefly what the 92 consensus is for someone that might not understand what it is. Okay, well, the 92 consensus is first a fabricated term by Su Chi, and he admitted it in 2006 that he fabricated it in the year 2000. So now you have to look back, 92, that was just when the people were beginning to freely elect their legislators. So it was really a party-to-party -party consensus. 
between the Guomingdan and the Chinese Communist Party. So that's the first part. On the second, you've got to look at the terms of it, you know, the agreement that there is one China with different interpretations. Uh, but they then limited the different interpretations. Now that one China issue, Bill, I think that's a good topic for you for a future show mm -hmm. to really nail that thing down because you know, China will always bring up one China whenever, like when Tsai Ing-wen went to the United States and on her way to Central America, and they keep saying, you've got to repeat the one China declaration. Mm -hmm. You really got to clarify that to declare one China does not mean the U.S. agrees to China's interpretation of what that is. The... Um, and of course, for China, it means that Taiwan is a part of China. Of course. Um, okay. Well, just for the benefit of our listeners, so uh, why can't Tsai therefore recognize the 92 consensus? What would the ramifications be for her if she did? Okay. Uh, a ramification of it would be, I think, that she would be you know, accepting in a way, because China always tries to twist this that you not only accepted the consensus that there is one China, but Taiwan is a part of China. Mm -hmm. And that's not so. You know, there there's much argument to be dealt with there. And so we, or Taiwan cannot, you know, just blindly say, yeah, we accept this. It's like locking yourself into a long-term debt. The mm -hmm. uh, so it's, you know, we say, let's more, let's talk about peace on the Taiwan Strait. Let's talk about dealing with each other. Uh, but let's not preset the game that you win at the end. Mm. Okay. So it, it really, if she were to accept the 92 consensus, she would lose her party, would she? I mean, her party, uh, the DPP, the Democratic Progressive Party, is one that is obviously not very fond of China, and um, hold some hope of independence for Taiwan one day. If she were to recognize the one China policy, the 92 consensus, then it seems to me she could very well be in a situation that Chen Shui-bian was in, uh, which would be that uh, he, when he was considered to be somewhat friendly to China, people left him and joined other parties. She would, she would face the same fate, wouldn't she? Yeah, that that uh, she'd kind of be in a way trapped the same way that Chen was, you know, or you know they tried to trap Chen. Mm -hmm. uh, I, if I were in that bargaining position, I would say, well, let's wait till you become a democracy and let's talk about it. <laughs> yeah, that's not going to happen for a long time. I think we all know that. Well, um, how about her cabinet? How would you evaluate her cabinet? What about her premier, uh, Mr. Doctor, I should say, Lin Chuen? Uh, how would you evaluate him and his uh, cabinet that he's put together? They seem to be having a lot of trouble. Okay. They, uh, actually, something I want to throw in here, Bill, you know, just to uh, kind of liven it up a little, that you know, we, we really haven't touched the phone call of Psy to Trump. Okay. And that, uh, that in a way, was, I, in my mind, a good move. The, it stirred the pot. It got everyone talking. But it began to make them aware of what really is the Taiwan situation. And in a way, got Taiwan back in the game. It kept Taiwan from being marginalized and discussed by other people, but not being accepted as a player. You know, um, I, I think that's true. But on the other side of the coin, it, it seems to me that call created a lot of uh, trouble for Taiwan, too. Ever since that call took place, and of course it got everybody in Beijing all rattled and shook up, you had the thing where um, trying to put pressure on Nigeria to have the Taiwan Trade Office move from the capital to the port city of Lagos. Um, 
you had, you know, some other uh, events take place that, that seemed to suggest that maybe that call, while I agree with you, I liked it in lots of ways, but maybe it's having some ill effects as well. Uh, I, I, I understand the trouble, and the trouble is real, but at the same time, I would say it's necessary. Mm. You know, I, otherwise, China will be like the frog in the water that the gradually turned up to be boiling. Mm. Uh, China will keep the pressure on and always, you know, retaliate in some way. But what this has done, and of course, it now with Trump coming in, it has shifted the attention into other areas. So mm. I, I still think it was a very good idea. It's a, you know, time to say, hey, we're still here. We're not going to be marginalized. Okay. We know we're going to get pressure, but we'll accept that. The uh, it's a uh, you know a much better thing. Okay, we're down to about a minute and a half here, so let me uh, let me squeeze in this question. Uh, maybe if you could get a, a somewhat brief answer to this, um, how would you, since you've lived in Taiwan a long time, how would you evaluate a Taiwan democracy? I, I know I'm probably asking for a lot here and, and suggesting a brief answer in a minute and a half, but we we got to try to squeeze this one in. Okay. I see it as progressing very well, Bill. It's going through a lot of growing pains, but I see it as definitely progressing. I'm going to throw out some quick things for you. I see, you know, on size record, transitional justice has still to be served. That will probably come in the summer. The pension thing, the state assets, those are things coming. Uh, an interesting thing, Bill, the KMT, here's a, they have five people now competing for the new chairman. Mm. That's a very unusual thing on the KMT side. And I'm going to throw in one more fact. Okay, and that'll probably bring us up to our close, so here you go. And 97% of our people are covered by health insurance. I challenge any country to match that. That's a really, really good point. And we all know that Taiwan Healthcare, the standard is quite good and quite high. Okay, well, I think we're just about at the end. Okay, Bill, one more point. I well, gotta, I, don't, I don't think we have time. We're, we're, I'm sorry, but we're out of time. <laughs> well, okay, it looks like our time is up again. Uh, thanks, Doctor. I want to thank Dr. Key for joining us, and thank you for viewing. Next week, my guest will be well-known Taiwan scholar, Professor J. Bruce Jacobs, Monash University Professor Emeritus, joining us from Melbourne, Australia. See you then.